Hello, my name is Anthony Allen, and this is a session PowerShell scoping for mere mortals. And of course, a big thank you to PSConf EU 2020 sponsors Microsoft System Frontier, Script Runner, and PowerShell One. So let's have a look what's on the agenda. Of course, we're going to be talking about scoping, what it is and why it's important. Knowing what scoping is can help you troubleshoot problems that you have with your scripts or modules. We're going to be having a look at lexical scoping and dynamic scoping. One of the issues I had after watching Bruce Payette's talk about scoping in 2017 at PSConf EU was what all the different terms meant. So I'm going to try and clear some of these, these terms up. We're going to be having a look at what .NET value types versus reference types are. Knowing what the difference is and how they can affect your scripts can save a lot of headaches when troubleshooting what would appear to be scoping issues, but actually aren't. We're going to look at the basics of scoping in PowerShell. What kind of constructs within PowerShell actually create scopes and what constructs don't? And how nested scopes work and things like the call operator and the dot source operator. We're going to look under the hood in PowerShell at run spaces, session state and execution context. Understanding what session state is and how it can affect your scopes can save a lot of headaches in the future. Module script blocks and closures affect how variables are looked up and are very tightly coupled to session state and scopes. So we'll be looking into this in a lot of detail. And finally, we're going to look at scope modifiers and options, which is how you can specify which scope a variable is written to or read from. So what is scoping? Scoping limits the visibility of variables from pieces of code, stopping variables that are defined in one piece of code from being read or overwritten in another piece of code helps us keep control of the state of the program. Imagine that you have a variable called state in your current function. But there was also a variable called state in another module library that you are using. If changing the value of the state variable in your function also changed the value of the state variable in the other module, can you imagine the chaos that would ensue? Limiting the visibility or modification of variables to just the current snippet of code reduces the likelihood of unexpected results and also means we have a lot less to keep track of when typing into the code editor. Back when I attended Bruce Payette's excellent session on scoping at PSConf EU in 2017, lexical scoping and dynamic scoping were mentioned a lot. I had trouble at the time understanding the terms, so I'm going to try to explain them with some examples. Lexical or static scoping, as it is also known as, is the default scoping method for most modern programming languages. Lexical scoping is very strict on the visibility of variables. It means that a variable that is defined in a block of code is only visible to that block of code. To make it visible to another section of code, you must attach it to an instance of a class, for example. This can be seen in PowerShell classes. Lexical scoping allows for the compiler to verify that variables are in scope before you can use them. So if you haven't defined your variables correctly, you can't even run the code. Dynamic scoping is a lot more relaxed about where variables are defined. If a variable isn't found in the current scope, the engine will carry on looking up the chain of scopes until the value is or is not found. This adds a lot more flexibility and terseness into how code can be written, but at the cost of a higher chance of errors or unexpected results. PowerShell scripts and functions use dynamic scoping. So here in this block of code, we can see we have a function called getDynamicScope. Within this function, we have no variables defined. However, we are looking up the variable called some variable. Here, outside of the function, we define some variable with a, with a string. And then we call the, call the function. If we run this block of code, we can see that hello from outside of the function was actually resolved from outside of the function. This is dynamic scoping. Because in static scoping, this wouldn't be allowed since some variable is not defined inside of the function. So let's have a look at static scoping. Here you can see I have a PowerShell class. PowerShell classes are statically or lexically scoped. This means that here I'm already getting a warning. I'm trying to use a variable that isn't even defined here. So I get this warning variable is not assigned in the method. To fix this, I actually have to define some variable as a property of this class. 
And then I have to return the instance, the actual property using the this sum variable. This gets rid of all the red squiggly lines and I can actually run this code. Although not strictly related to PowerShell scoping, it's important to understand what reference types and value types are in .NET. I myself have run into problems before when I was getting strange behavior in my scripts because I didn't understand how values of variables were being handled under the covers by .NET. Just two weeks ago, I saw a post from someone in my local user group who ran into exactly the same issues. In .NET, there were two types of variable, value types and reference types. When a variable is a value type, that variable contains the actual value within it. So if you assign a new variable that takes the value of the current variable, the contents of that variable are copied to the new instance of the variable. Value types are amongst others, integers, chars, datetime, and all numeric types. When using reference types, on the other hand, an address to the location of that object is stored within the variable. If you copy or assign a variable to a new variable, only the address is copied. That means that if you change the value of the object that is referenced by that variable, the changes will be seen in both of the variables. You can see in the image that the value type, when passed to the method fillCup, receives a copy of the cup. And this is only fills the cup within that instance of the cup. When the cup is a reference type though, the address of the cup is passed to the method. And filling the cup fills both the cup and the cup variable and within the method. This is a lot easier to understand with some examples. So let's have a look at some demo code. First of all, let's have a look at value types. First of all, let's try to understand what's actually happening in this piece of code. We have a function called test value type. Here, after the function, we define a variable, some variable. We write out the value of that variable to the host, and then we run the function and as the input parameter to the function, we specify some variable. We're going to write out the value of that variable, and then once we exit the function, we're going to write out the value of some variable again. So let's run this code and see what happens. So here we can see that we set some variable to one, and then we set that some variable into uh, our function, change the value to five, and then we come out and we've printed out the value of that variable. So we can see that it was one, and then it's five, and then it's one again, which means the value of that variable was not changed from within the function. The actual value of the variable was copied when we specified it as a parameter into the function. So let's have a look at reference types then. Here we can see I have another function. This looks almost the same as we had in the first version. Although this time we're using a hash table instead of an integer. I will say now that using strings, even though they're not strictly value types, they have the same kind of result as if you used to use it, use it as a value here. So sending in a string would actually create a new version of the string. If I'm going to be honest, I'm not quite sure why that is, but that's what it is. If, however, we have a more complex type, a hash table, for example, and here I defined a hash table with a name of Anthony. I'm going to write out the value of that key name to the to the host and then I'm going to send it into our function here as the input value as the par parameter input input val and then within the function I'm going to change the value of input val to bob and then I'm going to exit the function and then afterwards I'm going to write get out some variable again so it's still the variable I have here now a lot of people get tripped up here because they expect if they change something in within the function, it's not going to affect anything outside the function. But if you remember, since it's a reference type, it's only sending the address to this variable when we input it into the function. So let's run this code and see what happens. So here we see before the function, it's got my name, Anthony, and then we send that variable into the function. We change the name to Bob and then we exit the function and write out some variable name again. And you can see it's actually changed the name to Bob because the hash table is a reference type and we've only changed the actual memory location of the value of that, that variable. So we know a scope is a window in which variables are currently visible, but when a scope's created, when you open PowerShell and enter the prompt, what you are typing into is the global scope. 
Whenever you execute a function or a script block, a new scope is created, which is generally a child scope to the scope you're calling from. Any further calls to functions or script blocks from within those functions creates further scopes down the tree. Now scopes aren't created in a straight line from the caller down the function chain or the call stack, which we will cover later. It is important to know things that do create scopes and do not create scopes. A script, script block or function will generally create a new scope in the chain. However, keywords which have a script block body such as for each and if do not create a new scope. Other things which do not create new scopes are com compile commandlets and using the dot source operator. So let's see how this looks if we run a simple script from the command line, for example. So here I've got a script where I have a script block, a function, and then I call the function, which then in that turn calls a script block. When I run this from the command line, do something is run in the global scope. And then when we call do something, it creates a new scope, which is a child scope to the global scope. So here we have a new scope, which is attached to the function. And then we define the variable function variable. Since we're in the function scope at the moment, this variable is defined within the function scope. On the next line, we call the script block. When we call the script block, this creates another new scope, which is a child scope to the function scope, since the function scope called the script block. We define the variable sp variable which gets defined within the script block scope. Now we've completed this chain of commands. This is gonna go back to the caller now. So when we get to the next line in the script, right host, those two scopes that we've created have gone out of scope. So they don't exist anymore. So those variables don't exist anymore. If we have a look instead of using the dot source operator, I've created the same script, but now instead of the call operator, I'm using the dot source operator, which, ex which does not create a new scope when executing a script block. So we start again. We run this script and it starts by executing do something. This is running the global scope. Go into the next line. We go into the function do something, which creates a new scope, the function scope underneath the global scope. Now, we define the function variable, which of course gets created within the function scope, the same as the last time. But now since we're using the dot source operator on the script block, it does not create a new scope. So when we create go into the script block, we're still within the function scope. We define the S SB variable and that gets created within the function scope. And then after we've finished this chain of execution of functions and script blocks, we go back to the command line on the next line and the two scopes are disposed of and all the variables within them. So now it's time to talk about session state. Session state is an integral part of PowerShell and is tightly coupled to scopes. Internally within PowerShell, the type name of scopes is session state scope. Within a session state, things like variables, exported functions and commandlets and the current location are stored, as well as scopes. When the PowerShell process is opened, such as opening up a new terminal, a new run space is created. The run space is a global session state. The global scope, which we've just seen in the previous slides, is attached to this global session state. Each run space that is created has an execution context, and the execution context has a lot of the internal workings of PowerShell, so the parser, the help system is within the execution context. And then each run space has a global session state, each module has its own session state, and each session state can have multiple scopes. To make this easier, let's have a look at the next slide, which has a diagram. So here we can see we have the PowerShell process in the outermost box. Within this process, we have a run space, which it could be just opening up the terminal. And then within this run space, we have a global session state. And here we have the global scope, which we looked in in the previous slides. So every time you import a module, it creates a new session state, which is attached to that module. And then each, mod each of these session states has its own scope. The uppermost scope within the module session state is called the script scope. If we look at module B, for example, this is currently invoking a function within the module. Now, when you invoke the function, the function scope 
is a child of the script scope from within that session state. So if you to try and resolve a variable within the function scope, if it can't find the variable, it's first going to look into the script scope. If it can't find it there, it's going to look up into the caller, up to the global scope. So let's have a look at the session state, how it looks in the actual code. If you look inside the execution context variable, there's a property called session state, which will get you the current session state. So here you can see that module, there's no, no value for module, which means that the session state is the global session state. And then we also have some extra properties here, which allow us to work with the, the session state. So for example, PS variable, there's some methods there that we can use to get values of variables for this session state. Now I've created a very simple module here that basically has a script variable and a function defined within it. So let's import that module. I get the module info of that module. And then we can actually have a look at the session state of that module. So remember a session state is created for every imported module. So if we look at this session state, we can see that module isn't null anymore. It's actually demo module. And then we have the same properties. So for example, you can use PS variable to get the value of the module variable from within the module. So I'll use uh, module dot session state dot PS variable dot get value. And I'll use my history to get value of the module variable. And we can see hello from demo module. So we've got the value from within the session state. So using the call operator, I can actually execute a script block within the modules context. So when you use the call operator, it actually creates a new scope under the script scope, if you remember, which we spoke about earlier, which run, this script block runs in. So if I run this piece of code here, you can see that there's not much. There's just some default variables within there. But what we can do is if we use the dot operator, as I said before, it does not create a new scope. So we can actually execute code directly within the script scope, which if we remember is the top level scope within the module session state. So if we run this with a dot operator, we can actually see, we see module variable, hello from dem demo module, which is in the script scope of the module. If we want, we can even use the enter nested prompt to create a new prompt within the script scope of the module. So here I'm now in my terminal, I'm within the script scope. So if I do get variable scope zero, we can see here's my module variable. I can set this to something different. Hello from nested prompt. Now when I've exited the nested prompt, I'm back to my root level terminal. So what we can actually do is if we run the command get script variable from the module, It says, hello from nested prompt, because I entered the, the script scope, updated the variable, and then I exited again, and it set the value of that variable within the script scope of the module or the session state. So in my previous talks for PSCon for you, I fanboy Patrick Meinecke, and it would be churlish not to do so again. Patrick's module implied reflection and a blog post, which I will link to at the end of the session, have been instrumental in giving me the knowledge to write this talk. So here I'll import the module. Uh, and then if we have a look at execution uh, context session state again, we can see we get a lot more ver uh, properties here, including all the internal private properties that we're not really meant to see. If we look at this one internal, we actually have it's a type of session state internal. So we'll have a look in here, and here we can see a lot of information. This is really useful in understanding how session state and scopes work. Here you can see there's a global scope, a module scope, the current scope, and the script scope. Now, a lot of those may be the same. In Patrick's blog, blog post, he provided a, a little command that which allows you to look at the hash code of each of the scopes. So if we have a look at PS state tree, 
we can see here the global scope, the module scope, the script scope and the current scope are all the same. So now we can actually look inside the module session state. So if we look inside the session state and then look inside its internal session state, we can have a look at the script scope and actually look at the variables which reside within the script scope. So sure enough, here we have the module variable, which is of a type PS variable. If we actually look at the value of that, we can see that the value of that is hello from nested prompts, which we changed when we entered the nested prompt and updated the script variable. Okay, let's look at a bit more of an involved example. So in this script, I have two modules. Each of them is going to have its own session state. I also have a function in the script scope that I'm going to be calling. So if we actually look at what this is going to be doing, we can see we define our modules. And then the first thing it's going to do is it's going to sign from global scope to the result. And then the next thing it's going to do is invoke from module B. So once we come into module B, we're going to see it's going to assign from module B to the result. And then it's going to invoke uh, from module A. So once we go into module A, it's going to print out the result. Now, intuition would probably tell you that you'd like to think that the result that it's going to print out is from module B because that's where the call stack is. So in other words, when we try to look up what result is, it's going to look at where the last command was called from. So that would be from module B. So it prints out from module B, but it doesn't. We'll step through the code to see what's actually going on. One thing I will note is that I've actually instrumented my code with some extra commands to print out the scope graph. You can find the code within the repo, although to be honest, it's not a great code. So look at it at your own risk. But let's have a look and see what happens. So at the moment, I've invoked the script in a debugger and I'm setting a result from global scope. Now, I've created a this is what the graph looks like at the moment. So where we are at the moment, just to show you what this graph is, <clears throat> where we say current, these boxes with a black stripe at the top and these with the numbers are different scopes within the current run space. So where it's green current, that's the, that's the scope where we currently are. Each one of the ones with a number, that's just the hash code of the scope to uniquely identify it. We can also see the module that I've created to instrument the code is also included here, but we can ignore this. What I've also included in the white boxes is a session state. So here we can see there's a global session state, which we mentioned, and there's also a session state for the module that I've created to instrument the code. So if we go to the next breakpoint where we set result, we can see that results has been set in the global scope here. So now we're going to jump into invoke from module B. So what's going on here? So we've gone into module B. We're in the command, in the function, invoke from module B. We've set the result here to from module B. Now remember, a function creates a new scope beneath the script scope. So let's have a look in the graph and see what's happened here. So here we can see we've got a new session state, module B here. And then that's connected to the script scope. And the script, script scope's parent scope is the global scope up here. Now, the function we're currently in is here, where we have set result is from module B. And then next, we invoke from module A. So now we're in module A. And we can see here in the graph again that here is module A. We have a new session state for the module. We have a new script state for the module here. And we're in the function, which is the current state here. We haven't set any variables, so there's no variables here. Although you will see that for the script, script scopes, both in modular A and module B, we have the script variables that we have set. Now, we can see now that the variable resolution doesn't go up the call stack. It goes up to the script scope. Now, the script scope's parent scope is always the global scope here. So it's going to look here, and then it's going to look here. It's not going to look over here where we say result from module b so if i go to the next line yep we can see here it says from global scope so 
So then at the end, just to reiterate the point, I've created the function within the script and we're going to invoke from script scope. So if we look here, we're back in the global scope again and we can see result from module B, which we created in the function, as isn't attached to any other scope now. It's an orphan state. That state doesn't that scope doesn't exist anymore. It's just there without any any variables in it. So we'll step into invoke from function scope. And now we can see in the in the graph here that we're now in a child scope to the global scope because we're not in any module. So here we've created a we've set the variable within the function scope from function scope here and now we're going to invoke from module a going back into module a so we're back in the module a and here we're going to look up results again it's not going to look up go back go and look up from the function it's going to again follow up the scopes from the function scope up to the script scope of module a and then up to the global scope there you go, from global scope yet again. So let's have a look at script locks. We'll also take a look at closures and what they are. So a script lock always executes in the session state in which it's attached to. So if we create a, a, a variable, which is from global scope, which you'll remember because we're in the global scope when we open the PowerShell prompt, we'll create a script lock. Within the script block, we use the script modifier here to set SB variable to say from script block. Now, if we execute this, you have to remember that when we execute this, it creates a new scope. But the script modifier here specifies that SB variable is to be set in the script scope, which is actually also the global scope here since we're running from the root level here. So let's just have a look at this. And now we look at SB variable. Yeah, and it set it to from script block. If we have a look at the if we have a look at the script block, we can actually see there's a session state attached to it. And just to show you that it's the same session state as the one we're currently in, they're the same thing. The script block session state and the execution session state. They're the same, they're the same. So now a closure. Closure is just a script block which has a session state attached. So let's have a look. So we create a new variable from global scope. Now we'll create a new script block and use get new closure. What this is going to do, this is going to create a new session state and attach it to this script block. So now we'll execute that and we'll run that and we'll have a look at the variable. And we'll say it's still from the glo global scope. It didn't change it from closure scope because since it's now got a session state attached, it's going to use this script modifier to put it into the script scope of the session state, which is attached to this, this script block. So what you also have to remember is even if we dot source this script block, it's not going to update this variable in our current scope because it doesn't create a new scope. It just runs it in the, in the base, in the first scope within the context of that script block. So I'll run that and then we'll have a look at closure variable again and it's still global scope. It hasn't set it to from closure scope because it's running in the context of the script scope within the session state that we've created when we run get new closure. So if we have a closer look at a closure, you can actually see that dynamic modules and closures are like exactly the same thing. So here, let's create a new closure, closures module. Here, we create a function with it and we export the function we've just created and run get new closure on there. So we'll run that and then we we'll actually run invoke that using the dot source operator and use get module. And you can see we have no module here, but what we can do if we actually look at SP, look at the module property of the script block, you can see there is a dynamic module there. So we can actually import that and if we run get module again, here yeah, we can see we've imported the module, which was actually a closure. So, and then finally, we can run the command from the closure. Hello from closure. So, dynamic modules and closures, they're 
I'm pretty sure they're more or less exactly the same thing, just a different way of actually creating them. But knowing that can kind of under, help you understand how closures work in the background. So now we're going to have a look at scope qualifiers. Scope qualifiers allow you to specify from which scope you want to read or write a variable. Using the knowledge that we have picked up so far in this session, we can recall that when you open the PowerShell prompt for the first time, global script and current scope are all exactly the same scope, and the script scope is always tied to a session state. There are three scoping qualifiers that can be used within scripts and modules to allow you to easily specify a common scope to access your variables. Scripts global and local. Using the script qualifier access the script scope of the current session state. The global qualifier allows you to access the topmost scope which is attached to the global session state, whilst the local qualifier directly accesses the current scope. There is a fourth special qualifier too, using, which allows you to pass variables to script blocks that are going to be run outside the current run space. Some examples of these are invoke command, start thread job and for each object dash parallel. We can also specify options to our variables, which affect how they behave within scopes. Setting a variable to constant stops a variable being overwritten or removed from the current scope. Making a variable read-only allows it to be overwritten using set variable force. An all, an all scopes variable is accessible to be both read and written to from all child scopes. And a private variable is only able to be read from the current scope. You can also specify a combination of options on variables. Specifying that a variable is constant and all scopes, for example, stops you from creating a variable with the same name in any child scope. So let's have a look and see how we can use scoping qualifiers. So as a refresher, we'll import Patrick Mineke's show PS state tree command. And we'll have a look at the current state tree. So here we can see that the current scope is exactly the same as the script scope, the module scope, and the global scope. That means changing the variable in any of these scopes is going to change it in all the rest of the scopes because of the same scope. So just to demonstrate this, I've created a variable called global variable, and I'm going to set this without using any qualifiers. And then here I'm going to look, use the global qualifier to look up global variable. Now global isn't a special scope that just exists somewhere it's the same scope we're currently in so if we have a look at this we can see this is a global variable now the script scope is also the current scope and is also the same as the global scope in the current context we're in at the moment so using the script qualifier here is going to set that this the global variable value to this string here because it's the same scope so we'll run this one and we'll have a look at global variable again and we can see this is the same scope as global. Now we'll have a look and see how global and script qualifiers affect closures. This is equally applicable to modules, since closures and modules both have a new set, their own session states attached. So in, in this closure, I'm going to use the global qualifier to set the value of global variable to modified from closure module. And then I'm going to use the script qualifier to set the same set the value of the variable so that this is no longer the same scope as global. So we'll see what happens. So define this, the closure, we'll run the closure, and we'll have a look at the value of global variable. So here we can see the value of global variable is modified from closure module. So it took its value from this line here and not this line here because the script qualifier here changes this variable in the script scope of the session state which is attached to the closure. This is exactly the same behavior as if you was to run this within a module. So let's have a look and see how the using qualifier affects variables. So here we're going to specify a variable using variable. Now here I'm not going to run this but imagine I'm going to run invoke command against a remote computer. What's actually going to happen here is it's going to take the value of this variable and send it into the remote session. So we can get the value of the variable from out from the scope where we're running invoke command. A limitation though is you can't assign variable values using the using qualifier. 
So here we can see Pelshaw actually tells us that we can't use the using qualifier here. The assignment expression is not valid. Using the using qualifier, however, when the script block is to be run within the same PowerShell process via start thread job or for each object parallel, for example, allows us to send in variables of objects which are reference types. So remembering back to the beginning of the session, sending in a reference type allows us to send the address of the actual object stored in memory, which allows us to modify it within a separate run space. Here I'm using the concurrent dictionary. When accessing objects from multiple threads at the same time, it's important to use a type that can handle multiple writes at the same time from different threads. The collections in System Collections Concurrent were designed for just this use case. For each object parallel runs a specified script block in new run spaces, which it fires up in the background. The amount of run spaces is controlled by using the throttle limit parameter. Within the script block, I'm setting the key of the integer being passed in by the pipeline with the value of the current thread ID. Let's run it and see what happens. So here we can see each number being passed in by the pipeline and it's being set to the current thread ID. So let's look at variable options. So as mentioned, the private option stops a variable from being visible to child scopes. So here I'm going to set private variable to the value I'm private. If we print out the value of this variable, we can see it says I'm private. However, if we invoke a new script block and try to write out the value of that variable, let's see what happens. It's blank. The value of the variable doesn't get propagated down to the child scope or the child scope can't look up the variable when it starts looking up the scope tree for the value of private variable. Constant variables can't, written, can't be written over or even removed. So let's create a new variable, constant variable. We'll have a look at the value. I'm constant. So let's try to set constant variable to a new value. No, we get an error. We can't overwrite it because it's a constant variable. Let's try using set variable force. Nope, we still can't overwrite it. Try removing it. Nope, we can't remove it either. It's there for good. Read-only variables are kind of similar, but they can be overwritten by using force. So here we'll set the read-only variable. We'll look at the value of the read-only variable. And we'll try to overwrite it here. Nope we get a write error. However, using set variable force allows us to write over the variable. Yeah. All scopes makes a variable exist in all the child scopes. So if you remember, when you just create a normal variable, it gets created in the current scope. And then if you create a child scope, it's going to be looked, looked up the scope chain until it finds the variable. Or if you create or assign a variable, it's going to be assigned in the current scope. So let's just have a look and see how this works. So we'll create a variable using the all scope option. We'll have a look at the variable value. And then we'll X run a script block using the new scope, using the call operator, which creates a new scope under the current scope. So we'll run this. And then back from the current scope, we'll have a look at the value of all scope variable. And we can see it actually got changed from the, from the new scope without using any qualifier there. Let's have a recap of what we went through today. We looked at the differences between lexical scoping and dynamic scoping and learned how PowerShell scripts and functions are dynamically scoped, whereas PowerShell classes are statically or lexically scoped. We understood the difference between reference types and value types in .NET and how understanding them can stop you running into issues that you may assume are issues due to scoping. We had a look at how the call operator or ampersand creates a new scope and the dot operator does not create a new scope. When using a dot operator with a closure or a function within a module, the scope the code runs in is the session state script scope. We also saw how we can invoke code or create a new nested prompt within a module. We finally looked at how we can use scoping qualifiers and variable options to affect how variables are accessed in different scopes. 
If there's one important thing to take away, it's how tightly coupled scopes are to session states. Variables get resolved up from within modules, up to modules, up to the script scope of the session state, and then to the parent of the global session state. Understanding, understanding this will certainly help stop any head scratching when you are wondering why you can't find your variables. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for watching. You can find all the code and the PowerPoint slides at PSConfEU's GitHub repository. I'd also like to say a big thank you to the following people who have greatly assisted in giving me the tools and knowledge to make this talk. Patrick Mynecki for his excellent module Implied Reflection, which allowed me to peek under the hood of PowerShell and see what was happening. Also his excellent blog post on states and scopes, which gave a great explanation into how the state tree is made up. Bruce Payet and Jakob Yarlis have also given fantastic talks at PSConf at EU2, where they've really helped give me an understanding of scoping. And a short piece about me. My name is Anthony, and I'm a site reliability engineer at Snow Software. I just like playing with computers whenever I get the spare time from working and looking after my two young kids. You can find me on Twitter under the handle PSADM. Please give me a follow.